The Mystics of Muhlenberg by Thomas Ligotti If things are not what they seem, and we are forever reminded that this is the case, then it must also be observed that enough of us ignore this truth to keep the world from collapsing. Though never exact, always shifting somewhat, the proportion is crucial. For a certain number of minds are fated to depart for realms of delusion, as if in accordance with some hideous timetable, and many will never be returning to us. Even among those who remain, how difficult it can be to hold the focus sharp, to keep the picture of the world from fading, from blurring in selected zones, and, on occasion, from sustaining epic deformations over the entire visible scene. I once knew a man who claimed that, overnight, all the solid shapes of existence had been replaced by cheap substitutes. Trees made of poster board, houses built of colored foam, whole landscapes composed of hair clippings. His own flesh, he said, was now just so much putty. Needless to add, this acquaintance had deserted the cause of appearances, and could no longer be depended on to stick to the common story. Alone, he had wandered into a tale of another sort altogether. For him, all things now participated in this nightmare of nonsense. But although his revelations conflicted with the lesser forms of truth, nonetheless he did live in the light of a greater truth, that all is unreal. Within him this knowledge was vividly present down to his very bones, which he had newly stimulated by a compound of mud and dust and ashes. In my own case I must confess that the myth of a natural universe, that is, one that adheres to certain continuities whether we wish them or not, was losing its grip on me and gradually being supplanted by a hallucinatory view of creation. Forms, having nothing to offer except a mere suggestion of firmness, declined in importance. Fantasy, that misty domain of pure meaning, gained in power and influence. This was in the days when esoteric wisdom seemed to count for something in my mind, and I would willingly have sacrificed a great deal in its pursuit. Hence my interest in the man who called himself Klaus Klingmann, Hence, too, that brief yet profitable association between us, which came about through channels too twisted to recall. Without a doubt, Klingman was one of the Illuminati, and proved this many times over in various psychic experiments, particularly those of the seance type. In this regard, I need only mention the man who is severally known as Nemo the Necromancer, Marlowe the Magus, and Master Marinetti, each of whom was none other than Klaus Klingman himself. But Klingman's highest achievement was not a matter of public spectacle, and consisted entirely in attaining an unwavering acceptance of the spectral nature of things, which to him were neither what they seemed to be, nor were they quite anything at all. Klingman lived in the enormous upper story of a warehouse that had been part of his family's legacy to him, and there I often found him wandering amidst a few pieces of furniture in the cavernous wasteland of dim and empty storage space collapsing into an ancient armchair, reposing far beneath crumbling rafters, he would gaze beyond the physical body of his visitor, his eyes surveying remote worlds and his facial expression badly disorganized by dreams and large quantities of alcohol. Fluidity! Always fluidity! he shouted out, his voice carrying through the expansive haze around us, which muted daylight into dusk. The embodiment of his mystic precepts, he appeared at any given moment to be on the verge of an amazing disintegration, his particular complex of atoms ready to go shooting off into the great void like a burst of fireworks. We discussed the dangers, for me and for the world, of adopting a visionary program of existence. The chemistry of things is so delicate, he warned. And this word, chemistry, what does it mean but a mingling, a mixing, a gushing together? These are things that people fear. Indeed, I had already suspected the hazards of Klingman's company, and, as the sun was setting over the city beyond the great windows of the warehouse, I became afraid. With an uncanny perception of my feelings, Klingman pointed at me and bellowed, The worst fear of the race! Yes, the world suddenly transformed into a senseless nightmare, horrible dissolution of things. Nothing compares. Even oblivion is a sweet dream. You understand why, of course. Why this particular threat? these brooding psyches, all the busy minds everywhere. I hear them buzzing like flies in the blackness. I see them as glowworms flitting in the blinding sun. They are struggling, straining every second to keep the sky above them, to keep the sun in the sky, to keep the dead in the earth, 
to keep all these things, so to speak, where they belong. What an undertaking, what a crushing task. Is it any wonder that they are all tempted by a universal vice, that in some dark street of the mind a soft voice whispers to one and all, Lay down your burden. Then thoughts begin to drift, a mystical magnetism pulls them this way and that, faces start to change, shadows speak, and sooner or later the sky comes down, melting like wax. But as you know, everything has not yet been lost. Absolute terror has proved its security against this fate. Is it any wonder that these beings carry on the struggle at whatever cost? And you? I asked. I? Yes, don't you shoulder the universe in your own way? Not at all, he replied, smiling and sitting up in his chair as on a throne. I am a lucky one, parasite of chaos, maggot of vice. Where I live all is nightmare, thus a certain nonchalance. I am accustomed to drifting in the delirium of history, and by history I include events, and even whole eras, that have never gone on record. Speaking with the dead can be so instructive. They remember what the living have forgotten, or would not know if they could. The true frailty of things. What happened in the old town of Muhlenberg, for example? Now there was an opportunity, a moment of distraction in which so much was nearly lost forever, so many lost in that medieval gloom, catastrophe of dreams. How their minds wandered in the shadows even as their bodies were seemingly bound to narrow, rutted streets, and apparently safeguarded by the spired cathedral, which was erected between 1365 and 1399. A rare and fortuitous juncture, when the burden of the heavens was heaviest, so much to keep in its place, and the psyche so ill-developed, so easily taxed and tempted away from its labors. But they knew nothing about that, and never could. They only knew the prospect of absolute terror. Klingman smiled, and then began giggling, his mind obviously turning inward to converse with itself. Hoping to draw his conversation outward, I said, Mr. Klingman, you were speaking about Muhlenberg. You said something about the cathedral. I see the cathedral, the colossal vault above, the central aisle stretching out before us. The wood carvings leer down from dark corners, animals and freaks, men in the mouths of demons. Are you taking notes again? Fine, then take notes. Who knows what you will remember of all this? Or if memory will help you at all? In any case, we are already there, sitting among the smothered sounds of the cathedral. Beyond the jeweled windows is the town in twilight. Twilight, as Klingman explained, had come upon Muhlenberg somewhat prematurely on a certain day deep into the autumn season. Early that afternoon, clouds had spread themselves evenly above the region surrounding the town, withholding heaven's light and giving a dull appearance to the landscape of forests, thatched farmhouses, and windmills standing still against the horizon. Within the high stone walls of Muhlenberg itself, no one seemed particularly troubled that the narrow streets, normally so cluttered with the pointed shadows of peaked roofs and jutting gables at this time of day, were still immersed in a lukewarm dimness which turned merchants' brightly colored signs into faded artifacts of a dead town, and which made faces look as if they were fashioned of pale clay. And in the central square, where the shadow from the clock towers of the town hall at times overlapped those cast by the twin spires of the cathedral on the one hand, or the ones from high castle turrets looming at the border of the town on the other, there was only grayness undisturbed. Where were the minds of the townspeople? How had they ceased paying homage to the ancient order of things? And when had the severing taken place that set their world adrift on strange waters? For some time they remained innocent of the disaster, going about their ways as the ashen twilight lingered far too long, as it encroached upon the hours that belonged to evening and suspended the town between day and night. Everywhere windows began to glow with the yellow light of lamps, creating the illusion that darkness was imminent. Any moment, it seemed, the natural cycle would relieve the town of the prolonged dusk it had suffered that autumn day. How well received the blackness would have been by those who waited silently in the sumptuous chambers or humble rooms. For no one could bear the sight of Muhlenberg's twisting streets in that eerie, overstaying twilight. Even the night watchman shirked his nocturnal routine. And when the bells of the abbey sounded for the monks' midnight prayers, each toll spread like an alarm throughout the town, still held in the strange luminousness of the gloaming. 
Exhausted by fear, many shuttered their windows, extinguished lamps, and retired to their beds, hoping that all would be made right in the interval. Others sat up with a candle, enjoying the lost luxury of shadows. A few, being itinerants who were not fixed to the life of the town, broke through the unwatched gate and took to the roads, all the while gazing at the pale sky and wondering where they would go. Whether they kept the hours in their dreams or in sleepless vigils, all of Muhlenberg's citizens were disturbed by something in the spaces around them, as if some strangeness had seeped into the atmosphere of their town, their homes, and perhaps their souls. The air seemed heavier somehow, resisting them slightly, and also seemed to be flowing with things that could not be perceived except as swift shadow-like movement, escaping all sensible recognition, transparent flight which barely caressed one's vision. When the clock high in the tower of the town hall proved that a night full of hours had passed, some opened their shutters, even ventured into the streets. But the sky still hovered over them like an infinite vault of glowing dust. Here and there throughout the town, the people began to gather in whispering groups. Appeals were soon made at the castle and the cathedral, and speculations were offered to calm the crowd. There was a struggle in heaven, some had reasoned, which had influenced the gross reality of the visible world. Others proposed a deception by demons, or an ingenious punishment from on high. Certain persons met secretly in well-hidden chambers, and spoke in stricken voices about old deities, formerly driven from the earth, who were now monstrously groping their way back. And all of these explanations of the mystery were true in their own way, though none could abate the dread which had settled upon the town of Muhlenberg. Submerged in unvarying grayness, distracted and confused by phantasmal intrusions about them, the people of the town felt their world dissolving. Even the clock in the town hall tower failed to keep their moments from wandering strangely. Within such disorder were bred curious thoughts and actions. Thus, in the garden of the abbey, an ancient tree was shunned, and rumors spread concerning some change in its twisted silhouette, something flaccid and rope-like about its branches until finally the monks doused it with oil and set it aflame, their circle of squinting faces bathing in the glare. Likewise, a fountain standing in one of the castle's most secluded courtyards became notorious when its waters appeared to suggest fabulous depths far beyond the natural dimensions of its shell-shaped basin. The cathedral itself had deteriorated into a hollow sanctuary, where prayers were mocked by queer movements among the carved figures and cornices, and by shadows streaming horribly in from the twitching light of a thousand candles. Throughout the town, all places and things bore evidence to striking revisions in the base realm of matter. Precisely sculptured stone began to loosen and lump, an abandoned cart melded with the sucking mud of the street, and objects in desolate rooms lost themselves in the surfaces they pressed upon, making metal tongs mix with brick hearth, prismatic jewels with lavish velvet, a corpse with the wood of its coffin. At last the faces of Muhlenberg became subject to changing expressions, which at first were quite subtle, though later these divergences were so exaggerated that it was no longer possible to recapture original forms. It followed that the townspeople could no more recognize themselves than they could one another. All were carried off in the great torrent of their dreams, all spinning in that grayish whirlpool of indefinite twilight, all churning and in the end merging into utter blackness. It was within this blackness that the souls of Muhlenberg struggled and labored, and ultimately awoke. The stars and high moon now lit up the night, and it seemed that the town had been returned to them. And so terrible had been their recent ordeal, that of its beginning, its progress, and its termination, they could remember nothing. Nothing? I echoed. Of course, Klingman answered. All of those terrible memories were left behind in the blackness. How could they bear to bring them back? But your story, I protested. These notes I've taken tonight. What did I tell you? Privileged information, confidences spoken off the historical record. You know that sooner or later each of the souls who occupied Mullenberg recollected the episode in detail. It was all waiting for them in the place where they had left it. The blackness, which is the domain of death. I remembered the necromantic learning that Klingman had professed, and to which I gave no small credence, but this was too much. Then nothing can be verified. 
nothing you can produce to back up your story. I thought you might at least conjure a spirit or two. You've never disappointed me before. Nor will I disappoint you tonight. Remember, I am one with the dead of Mullenberg, and with all who have known the great dream in all its true loquescence. They have spoken to me as I am speaking to you. Many reminiscences imparted by those old dreamers, many drunken dialogues I have held with them. Like the drunkenness of this dialogue tonight, I said, openly disdaining his narrative. Perhaps, only much more vivid, more real. But the yarn which you suppose I have merely spun has served its purpose. To cure you of doubt, you first had to be made a doubter. Until now, pardon my saying so, you have shown no talent in that direction. You believed every wild thing that came along, provided it had the least evidence whatever. Unparalleled credulity. But tonight you have doubted, and thus you are ready to be cured of this doubt. And didn't I mention time and again the dangers? Unfortunately, you cannot count yourself among those forgetful souls of Mullenberg. You even have your mnemonic notes, as if anyone will credit them when this night is over. This is my gift to you. This will be your enlightenment. For the time is right again for the return of fluidity, and for the world's grip to go slack. And later so much will have to be washed away, assuming a renaissance of things. Fluidity, always fluidity. When I left his company that night, abandoning the dead and shapeless hours I had spent in that warehouse, Klingman was laughing like a madman. I remember him slouched in that threadbare throne, his face flushed and twisted, his mouth wailing at some hilarious arcana known only to himself. To all appearances, some ultimate phase of dissipation had seized his soul. Nevertheless, that I had underrated or misunderstood the power of Klaus Klingman was soon demonstrated to me, though I wish it had not been. But no one else remembers that time when the night would not leave and no dawn appeared to be forthcoming. During the early part of the crisis, there were sensible, rather than apocalyptic, explanations proffered everywhere. Blackout, bizarre meteorological phenomena, an eclipse of sorts. Later these myths would become useless and ultimately unnecessary. As we had done before, we once again returned to this flimsy world. This world I must now view as a mere vapor of spectral manifestations, appearances cast out of emptiness, an ornamented void. As Klingman had promised, my enlightenment would be a lonely one. For no one else recalls the hysteria that prevailed when the stars and the moon dimmed into blackness. Nor can they summon the least memory of when the artificial illumination of this earth turned weak and lurid, and all the shapes we once knew contorted into nightmares and nonsense. And finally how the blackness grew viscous, enveloping what light remained and drawing us into itself. How many such horrors await in that blackness to be restored to the legions of the dead? For no one else living remembers when everything began to change. No one else, with the exception of Klaus Klingman and myself. In the red dawn following that gruesomely protracted night, I went to the warehouse. Unfortunately, the place was untenanted, save by its spare furnishings and a few empty bottles. Klingman had disappeared perhaps into that same blackness for which he seemed to have an incredible nostalgia. I, of course, make no appeals for belief. There can be no belief where there is no doubt. This is far from secret knowledge, as if such knowledge could change anything. This is only how it seems, and seeming is everything. 